Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Peart, and welcome to the Salty Science Podcast. And I'm super excited about this week's episode because we're going to be discussing the fall equinox. And why are we going to be discussing the fall equinox? Because it just happened here in the Northern Hemisphere this past Monday, September 23rd, 2019. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, they just had their spring equinox. And so big things are starting to happen all over the ocean. So let's dive in. So here's a quick disclaimer. For the sake of simplicity, in this episode, I'll be focusing on the fall equinox of the Northern Hemisphere, and what we'll be discussing still applies to the Southern Hemisphere, but just at a different time of the year. All right, so let's start out by first asking the question, what is an equinox? So according to the Oxford Dictionary, an equinox is the time or date at which the sun crosses the celestial equator when day and night are of equal length. And I looked it up, the celestial equator is an imaginary line in the sky just above the equator. And so the word equinox actually comes from two Latin words meaning equal and night. And so it would make sense that it would be called the equinox because day and night are supposed to be of equal lengths at this time. Although technically we still have more light than dark even at the equinox because the rays from the sun hits the earth which is a sphere at different angles, but more on this in future episodes. And of course, an equinox is different from a solstice. Like I mentioned before, an equinox is when the sun is directly over the equator, and a solstice is when the sun hits its northernmost or southernmost position. And solstices mark the beginning of summer and winter, while equinoxes mark spring and fall. And this is all due to the fact that the Earth is tilted at approximately a 23.5 degree angle as it orbits around the sun. And, of course, the equinoxes have played major roles in a number of historical, religious, and cultural celebrations all across the globe. And I myself personally celebrate the fall equinox with my youngest sister each year by having a special dinner where we challenge ourselves to serve at least a three-course meal that highlights pumpkin in a unique way. Kind of like our own personal Food Network holiday special. But anyway, so now let's ask the most important question of all. How does the fall equinox impact the ocean? Well, I'll say it really quickly right now. The fall equinox and the transition and progression into fall or autumn has a variety of different impacts on the ocean and marine organisms. But in this episode, let's focus on what we've learned from episodes 1 through 7 and see if we can derive an answer to our question, how does or how would the fall equinox impact the ocean? Okay, so let's start out by looking at the sun. In episodes 3 and 4, we discussed the sun and solar radiation energy, and we said that the sun is a star composed of mostly hydrogen and helium gases, and the sun is so large that there's a lot of pressure at its core, and that pressure squeezes four hydrogen atoms together to form one helium atom in a process called nuclear fusion. And when this happens, a huge amount of energy is released in the form of electromagnetic radiation energy. And even though the sun is similar to a black body in that it releases a full spectrum of electromagnetic radiation wavelengths, the Earth receives mostly the wavelengths of UV, visible, and infrared. But at the fall equinox, the sun itself isn't changing. It's still just hanging out in the middle of our solar system, just doing its thing. What's really changing is our position relative to the sun as we orbit around it. And so instead of the Tropic of Cancer at roughly 23.5 degrees north receiving the most amount of solar radiation, such as during the summer solstice, it's now the equator that is receiving the most amount of direct solar radiation or insulation. And as fall progresses and we move towards winter in the northern hemisphere, we start to receive less and less direct solar insulation until the winter solstice. And as we discussed in episodes 5 and 6, we know that the amount of solar radiation the ocean receives, what we also call insulation, impacts sea surface temperatures because this insulation is transformed into heat energy in the ocean. So at the fall equinox, the northern hemisphere is receiving less insulation while the equator is receiving more. So as fall continues, there will be a shift in sea surface temperatures where the further north you travel, the colder the water will be. But of course, this doesn't happen in just a quick moment because water has a high heat capacity, so it stores heat really well. And of course, if we were to look at temperature profiles of the ocean, we would start to see that surface to deep, the water will start to become closer and closer to the same temperature. And even closer towards the North Pole, 
water will start to get colder and even cold enough to start forming sea ice. While near the equator, this extra amount of solar insulation will favor evaporation. And both the formation of sea ice and evaporation take water molecules out of the ocean or out of the system, but leave behind the salt. So unless there is another source of fresh water, such as precipitation or rain, the salinity in both regions will start to increase. Or in other words, the water's gonna start to get saltier or more hypersaline. And like we learned in episode seven, when you increase salinity and decrease temperature, the density increases. So in the Northern hemisphere, the density of the surface waters is increasing. So that means it'll start to sink. And sinking water means vertical movement, which also then means mixing. And we can definitely observe this sinking in the Northern Atlantic Ocean. But at the equator, if a lot of evaporation is happening and is not being replaced by precipitation or rain, then the water is also going to get denser due to the higher salinity. But because it's also receiving more solar insulation, the temperature will also be increasing, which could cancel out any increase in density due to increased salt content. Because if we refer back to our TS diagrams, we know that depending on the combination of salinity and temperature, we can have the same density with a variety of different combinations of salinity and temperature. Okay, so now let's put it all together. During the fall equinox, the sun is directly over the equator. And then as fall progresses, the angle will continue to change until the sun is directly over the Tropic of Capricorn at approximately 23.5 degrees south during our winter solstice. So not only are we in the Northern Hemisphere getting fewer hours of daylight, but the angle of the sun in our hemisphere is also changing. And if the angle of the sun is changing, that means that the angle of incoming solar radiation is also changing. And we know that solar radiation energy is one of the main drivers of ocean surface temperatures. So the equatorial regions will be receiving the most amount of solar radiation or insulation during the fall equinox. While, on the other hand, the further north you go, these regions will receive less and less. So as the ocean near the equator receives more solar radiation energy, it will also start to gain heat energy and start to warm up. While the more northern regions would receive less solar radiation and would actually start to lose heat energy, which would mean that it will start cooling down. But of course, we wouldn't see this right away due to the ocean's high heat capacity. And then, of course, as we continue to progress into fall or autumn, the water, especially the further north you go, will start to get colder and colder and could get cold enough to start forming sea ice. And ice is fresh water, so as ice forms, the salt would be left behind, making the seawater even saltier or hypersaline. And because we know that salinity and temperature play a role in density, and cold, salty water is denser and heavier than in warm, less salty water, the cold and now extra salty water near the North Pole would start to sink, creating vertical movements of water, which means we'll have mixing. But at the equator, more heat also means more evaporation, and evaporation also leaves behind salt, making the water saltier, which then would also sink, unless the temperature starts to increase warm enough that the density would remain the same. And then also, if it were to start to rain, then the rain, which is also fresh water, would just sit on top of the salt water like a fresh water layer and would set up a type of stratification because warm fresh water is definitely less dense than warm salty water. And then this stratification would actually prevent mixing in the equatorial regions of the ocean. But then of course the combination of stratification and vertical mixing and changes in salinity and temperature and the amount of solar radiation all impact ocean circulation and climate and weather as well as where marine organisms can live and what food is available, which then would also mean it impacts fishing and tourism, which then also impacts local and global economies. And so yeah, if we put it all together, the fall equinox and the transition into fall months plays a major role, not only on our oceans, but also on different industries as well as economies. And like I said before, there are so many other ways that the fall equinox impacts our ocean, but we haven't quite discussed them yet, so I won't get into them now. But just as a teaser, start thinking about how having fewer daylight hours might also impact the ocean and marine organisms. Okay, so just as a quick review, in this episode, we went over a few definitions of equinox, as well as we started to draw on our knowledge from episodes 1 through 7 to derive an answer to the question, how does the fall equinox 
impact the ocean. So now let's ask the question, why do we care? Well, I'll give you some personal answers. One, when I was an intern at the Cape May Whale Watch and Research Center in Cape May, New Jersey, the fall equinox kind of marked the end of our season because the dolphins started to migrate further south towards Florida. And even here in Virginia, I've noticed that the dolphins are no longer hanging out and playing in our York River, but have also begun their migration southward. And two, I'm currently working on a particular NSF funded project with several other great people and this project requires us to collect water samples at dawn and dusk. So the change in daylight hours impacts what time we go out on the water to collect our samples. And three, the fall equinox and transition into fall also impacts what gear I take into the field and on the boat with me. So instead of going out in t-shirts and shorts or maybe thin pants, I have to start thinking of layers and pretty soon I'm gonna have to start thinking of using Mustang suits. And then also, I have friends who conduct the research both in Arctic and Antarctic waters. So I know that with the northern fall equinox, my friends who study the Arctic will be ending their field season, while my friends who study the Antarctic are just now starting to prepare for their field season. And then another reason why people might care about the fall equinox, well, for instance, I know that even here in Virginia, different ocean-related industries are starting to shut down for the winter. Okay, so now as we close this episode, I'll turn the question to you. How does the fall equinox impact you? Or can you think of other ways that the fall equinox impacts the ocean? And I invite you to share your answers with me because I'd love to hear them and what you have to say. So please email me at saltysciencepodcast at gmail.com. Or if you have any special traditions or celebrations that you observe during the fall season, I'd also love to hear about them too. So until next time, don't forget to reduce, reuse, recycle, and refuse, and to always stay salty. Thank you for listening to Salty Science. But guess what? You don't have to let the fun end here. Go to www.saltysciencepodcast.weebly.com where I've posted some cool videos, my study notes, and some really neat experiments that you can try at home. And if you want to follow along with my own research, you can follow me on Instagram user handle Teps Adventure. That's T-E-P-S Adventure. All Salty Science episodes are available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcast, and YouTube, plus a number of other podcasting apps. If you like the show, please rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes as this is the best way to spread the word about this podcast. Salty Science is listener supported, so if you would like to show your support, visit our Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash salty science, where you can either make a one-time donation of any amount or join the Salty Science crew for as little as a dollar a month. So visit the Salty Science Patreon and sign up today.